How are you? Right, now just a little more weird. I'm actually, uh, people need to know, are you happy? We're going to lift it. I'm going to take it very, very far away from me because I'm going to attempt not to rely on the the best Edison and holding the uh, lectern or whatever we want to call it. But okay, let's get into this. Is everything okay? My name's Chris. I'm one of the elders of the church. It is an absolute pleasure and honor to be here today. I'm really excited to be able to share with you what God has done in the church. As we begin, and I have to say this, I have to say this, I do have to say this, that put your hand up if you've ever said a prayer. Nearly every single person in the room has said, keep those hands up, keep those hands up, if, if you felt as as you were expected to be while you were praying. What I'm actually trying to say is, stay away for a second. Well done, thank you so much for helping me out. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that really interesting how as, as Christians we can still go through a period of depression? I was reading in, in the Discourse, and actually um, I was looking at the typical place of depression across different church denominations, I should say to you, and also non-churches, other religions, and those who are not in the church. people who are Christians, those people who are uh, apostatic, apostatic and this and that, not so Christian, don't go to church, maybe insert religious name here, the place of depression is the place of church. What's the deal? I was reading um, uh, Billy Graham Association of Latin America says that the word Christian and the word depression, they are contradictory to each other. Those two words should not go in the same sentence together. The Bible says rejoice, rejoice, and rejoice. Yet Christians are at the same time and very Christian and very Christian. And, and actually, topically, it's so, and again, I say so, so part of the answer topically is something to do with, with joy. I was looking at the, the word joy, because obviously if I'm not in a church, if I'm a non-Christian, I'm still using happy, the same language, using these images. We actually start the same place. This is a joy starting point. I had a look at my own notes this week. Joy is a state. It is an emotional state. It's something that is inside you, but it's it's a, it's an emotional happy state when you are in the happy notes here. It's the depths of something. When you are holding something that is a source of joy for you, it is a reason for joy for you. I read um, a, another website, and this particular website says this: whereas joy is an inner thing, happiness is an outer thing. Happy is an outer thing. When you think about this, what kind of place joy is? It's an inner thing. Happiness is an outer thing. Joy is an inward thing. Happiness can be temporary. Joy can be very long-lasting. Joy is something that can be fleeting. Happy is something that, that it says it gives you endurance. It helps you to stay carried. Whereas happiness is because you you happy, because that holds you, you give you happiness in life that makes you temporarily happy. So far, so good. Really bad, actually, but out of it. And and the same website says the same thing. It's an objective agreement. There is a reason. It's something that we as Christians can do that we've got a hold of that gives you that. And I started to close with this thing about meaning. There's this connection between meaning and joy. Something's giving me joy. Something is the source of my joy. 
started reading, uh, I, I bought it for Christmas, uh, a bit nasty, but I started reading ahead. Frankel, he, he was a survivor of the Holocaust. He was a survivor. He was a psychologist. He was a survivor of being in the labor camps in Nazi Germany. And actually, he would have inmates around him. Because his career, his training, was a psychotherapist, he would attempt to help his fellow inmates deal with the trauma of any minute now we could get thrown into the gas chambers. And he said this, the people who were most likely to survive were those who had a meaning, those who had a reason, those who had something that was keeping them going in the face of that trial. He said that meaning enabled them to face, oh, wasn't expecting that, the uh, face, you can turn it off, don't worry about all that stuff, it's fine. It's, uh, it can be distracting, we don't want to, it's okay. No, uh, no, we don't need to use my notes, it's okay. Um, I'm trying to avoid them, and now they're in my face. <laughs> there we go. Um, and, and so um, he discovered that these, these, the people who had meaning were those who kept going. And he said this, in the face of great trial, in the face of, of problems, it was those who made a decision to choose joy. It was those who made the decision, I'm living to see that person again, and one day I'm going to meet them again. There is a, a decision that we have to make based on something that means something to us. I've been, I've been reading, I've get, really getting into this stuff, and uh, actually, he comes from a particular type of philosophy called existentialism. Existentialism says this to us. Life is meaningless. We're going to live. We're going to die. There's no point. So what you have to do in the face of no point, no meaning to this, to this world, find something that gives you meaning, chase after that thing that gives you meaning, and that will give you your joy that you are seeking. And one day we close our eyes and we face oblivion and we've been a little bit distracted in the middle with those things that we grabbed along the way that gave us temporary joy. And, and, and what happens, I'm already doing it, what happens when you, you follow this, this particular type of thinking and go to the end result of, of where it will take you? I was thinking to myself, well, and, and, you know, psychology, I was very interested in psychology many, many years ago before I was a Christian. And, and, and sometimes the, the reason why we can chase after something, is it, is it because of a, a lack of something? Is it because of a, a lack of a particular thing that you missed out on an unmet need, maybe when you were a young child or something? You know, I discovered recently in, in summer um, a letter of mine I'd sent to my father in Spain. He's dead now, but one of my uncles still had the letter in his house. And in that letter, it's gone yellow now. It said, Daddy, please could I have for my 10th birthday a Lego pirate ship? Now, I never got that Lego pirate ship. All my life, I wanted a Lego pirate ship until I married my wife, Libby. I, oh, mum's now. But he didn't get any. Stop, st stop it, Chris. You always tell people she does. She, she'll, she'll fight with me now when I get in the car. Um, but, uh, <laughs> um, but Libby got me this Lego pirate ship when I got married for Christmas. And I had so much joy for like a week building this thing. It was exactly the one that I'd wanted all those years. Thank you, Libby. Problem is, where's that Lego pirate ship now? I don't want to dishonor my wife. It sat on my shelf for two years. It collected this layer of dust on it. And eventually, when my kids got old enough to get into Lego, they might have got their little hands on it, and then a little cannon got removed, and a little mast got removed, until the whole thing is now broken down and in a big Lego box somewhere else. It says something about our materials, doesn't it? This, this thing... We can say, right, there's, there's a meaning. I'm getting meaning by going after this thing I don't have. I never had. But one way or another, those things that we go after, one way or another, if it's a person like the Lego pirate ship, they will eventually deconstruct and break down. If it's, if it's the father that you never had and you, you, you know, you're, you're a lady, you're chasing these father figure people in your life, no, no person, no boyfriend or husband's ever going to quite meet that, that need. 
this, this chasing after something I didn't have doesn't kind of work in that regard. What if it's a wound? Now, I, I, I don't talk about this very often, but um, I was overlooked about six, seven years ago to be vice principal of the school I was in at that time. My, my principal, he actually had a shouting match that broke down into swearing between him, the managing director of the, the, you know, the entire UAE level school system and this guy saying, Chris is my man. I'm not leaving. And she was like, either I fire you or you let me put someone else in that position. And the wound that was, was created because I missed out on that thing, I spent the next sort of three or four years fighting my way in a different school, back up the ladder, masters in educational leadership, all of this stuff along the way. And one day I got into, I got very close, I didn't quite get there, but one day I got into this office, lovely office, lovely view, plants. That's, you've made it when you've got plants. You know, and, and leather chairs. <laughs> <laughs> it's the little things in life, isn't it? What you're saying, you're preaching on this. Don't chase after plants. Um, and, but I got there, and I went, honestly, in my heart, I went, is this it? Is this it? I worked so hard for this, and this is it. And I carried on working, and, and I actually eventually reached the point where I said, I don't need to be in this career anymore. I, I've stepped away now, but, but actually I don't tell again many people this, but actually the weird thing was, when I first started that career, do you know they tried to kick me out of teacher training school? Actually, it still speaks today. I wouldn't listen. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I knew best. Anyway, um, uh, character issues, uh, but they, they nearly kicked me out. And, and because of that, I'd always had a wound that followed me uh, KHDA, recommended teacher of the year, got that. I didn't get it, but I was close. This award, this award, this plaque, this certificate, all of these things. And I eventually reached a point where, like, I'm chasing this thing, but actually there's nothing more for me to prove in this career. I've, whatever was the initial trauma, the wound, the, whatever it was, it doesn't mean anything to me anymore. This thing I've been chasing, it just, it doesn't do anything for me anymore. And so, it could be we're chasing after a material thing or something we never had. It could be there was a wound that our demons, you know, they talk about people's demons, you know, not in a spiritual sense, but there's trauma and wounds that were, were driving them to do a certain thing. But what if you do get everything you could possibly ever want? What if I woke up tomorrow morning and my bank account said, you've got one billion dirhams. <laughs> how many lottery winners, okay, how many lottery winners have lost it all within 12 months and have fallen into deep depression? And again, I was reading articles about this, lead, not leadership, uh, uh, coaching articles, and it was saying this, for those whose profession is, I'm a life coach for the rich and the famous, this is the advice they give, keep moving. If I was a coach, and my mother, you're now a multi-billionaire, well done. Um, and, and she was like, I, I've come to the end of, I've, I've built this billion dollar industry. I, I've built this monopoly and I'm bored. It doesn't mean anything to me anymore. I, I could do this, or I could do this, or I could do this. But I don't know, what do I do? I would say, keep moving. You've done your business thing, sell it. Start a charity. How many successful businessmen, they move from the business, other people can run that. Now I'm going to do a charity thing that's going to impact the world. Then they do that. Someone says to him, hey, why do you get into acting? They do that. They make a success of that. They chase after that thing, the next thing that's going to give them meaning. I'll become the governor of, insert, place here. And I'll, oh, for those who know, I was in here, let him hear. And, 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 I was, and they go after that thing. And they go after that thing. And then, okay, you can't do that anymore. Write a book. And they go after that thing. If you've got all the material in the world, you've got no wounds or trauma driving you, you could do anything you want. Eventually, even the same billionaires fall into, can fall into depression if they suddenly find that their life is without meaning. So far, so good? Existentialism. Well, just keep chasing. Well, you know, you've got a hobby. 
What do you like? What, what would you like to do, but you never had time to do it? <laughs> okay, too busy. Okay, shout at me. Anything, a hobby you've not had time to do. Painting. So you'd be like, right, become a painter. You've got the money. Uh, hire some people to coach you. The most famous artists in the world. Throw money at them. They'll train you. Get to a point. What's next? And actually, when you look at statistics again, of people in care homes, you get to the end of your life, elderly care homes, do you know that the percentage of depression goes from like 3 to 5% to on average, internationally, 30% of people in care homes at any point, right, even today, are in a state of depression. wonder why. Well, it's obvious, isn't it? Their health is failing. They can't go after and chase the things that would have temporarily brought meaning and joy. Uh, I've retired, so now I'm going to get into golf. My legs are giving up. My knees are giving up. I can't do golf anymore. I'll read. I like reading. I can't read anymore. My eyes are giving up. My friends who I used to play golf with, they're passing away and dying now. Everyone who ever knew who I was, they don't know who I am anymore. They're either dead or all these young whippersnapper 10-year-olds are around. And, and, and every achievement I've ever done, anything I've ever done with my life, how many of us, honestly, know the names of our great, great, great granddaughter, or grand, granddad or grandmother? How many of us? We don't, do we? Those names have disappeared. Can you imagine that? You can understand, can't you? You can relate how depression can set in when you're in that state and you're facing oblivion, you're facing darkness, you can't do all those things the world has been telling you, chase after this, chase after that, chase after this. But eventually, time catches up with all of us. Interesting, eh? Existentialism. The philosophy of this world, find meaning by, you can be anything you want, go after it, it'll bring you joy. That will eventually fail. And, and the wisest man who ever lived, Solomon, the preacher who is the person speaking in Ecclesiastes, one of the most philosophical, best psychotherapy books that's ever been written, he says, I did it. I've done it. I've gone after the women. I've gone after the, 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 the lovely wine. I've, I've built my little empire. I've built my buildings. I've built even a little garden for myself. And all of it, it's like vapor. You grab it, and it's gone before you even grabbed a hold of it. Everything is meaningless, the preacher in Ecclesiastes says. And at the end of this, I've tried everything. I've done everything with my life. He says, think, last chapter of the book, in conclusion, the only thing we can do, fear God, obey him, follow what he says. There's something wrong with this human philosophy. There's something wrong with what this world says is how we should live our lives. But I was, I was thinking to myself, well, okay, there's joy. We've defined joy. We've got a common language. We know what joy kind of is. Okay, the world says this is how we have to live our life, and this is what brings us like a rat on a wheel. This is chasing after this carrot and the end of the stick or whatever it is. That's going to make me, me kind of happy. And, and that doesn't kind of work. And, and I was saying to myself, well, what's going on in, in church and not church? And, and why are depression rates kind of the, the same? And I kind of came to a place, I came to a conclusion. I looked at my apartment. I looked at my, the tower I live in. I realized the person next door is of a different religion. The person next door to me is of a different religion. But yet we all live in the same building. We all have the same apartments. We all live the same lives. We all go to the same jobs. Well, you go downstairs and look at the car park, and we all drive the same cars. There's someone with exactly the same car as mine, same color. Um, uh, they were slightly first before me. Um, but we, we drive the same. Why? Because whether I'm this religion or that religion, we seem to be, all of us, our heart chasing after the same things. There's, there is a, there's something not inside here. It should be. But there's something not inside this place. It should be. I'll repeat myself. 
that whether I go to that temple or this thing or that thing, we're all being told how to live our lives. And we're all, we're all being shaped, our heart is being shaped by the same experience of the world around us. The world that, if you read the book of Revelation, is a, a modern-day Babylon, which is actually, you scratch the surface, and below the surface, there are actually spiritual forces at work. Everything is a lie. Everything we've been chasing after, everything that we've been looking for as meaning, for meaning, it's all meaningless. It is as a vapor. You grab a hold of it and it slips out of your hands. It's all pointless. But we're Christians. <laughs> Surely there's some sort of difference. Surely the same joy that the world has, is that, is that meant to be our joy? Is our definition of joy exactly the same? Should it be the same as the world's version of joy? I'm going to ask us a massive favor. Big, big, big favor in a moment, but I'm not going to go there. Okay. I did look at my notes, but I look from afar. It's okay. Why is it we're searching for meaning? Why is it the heart of man, whether I'm this country, that nationality, this religion, we're all searching for this meaning which will give us joy? I'm going to run us through some passages now, if I can move through fast enough. This is what the Bible says we were meant to do. This is what the Bible says man was meant to do. Can I give us some? I don't know if you're going to throw up or not. Right, Psalm 86. I wonder if I can be fast enough. If not, I'll just give you the gist of it. Psalm 86, 9. Okay. All nations whom you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and they shall glorify your name, for you are great and do wondrous deeds. You alone are God. 1 Corinthians 6, 20. For you have bought with a price. You were, you have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Revelation 4, 11. Worthy are you, O Lord, and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things. And because of your will, they existed and were created. I could keep going. And you know what? I'm actually quoting you. I'm actually quoting you. I've quoted you the first six or so scriptures of 20 scriptures that in the 1600s, a lot of theologians came together, the Westminster divines, and they asked the question, what's the goal of man? What is the chief end of man? What is the point of man? What is the meaning of man? And they took all these scriptures and saw two things. The chief end of man, the point, what we're meant to do. Glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Amen. You see, because of this fallen world that we live in, because we're born into this same world, like the Matrix, where we're fed all this information and we're fed all this stuff in our hearts and we drive down the highway, there's adverts, we watch TV, YouTube, whatever. Adverts, by this. actually, this is it in my notes. You know what I saw last night? I pointed it out to Libby. I was like, this is disgusting. I was on Facebook. I honestly shouldn't be watching Facebook videos then. And it was like, my boyfriend cheated on me, so he got me this. And it had this happy musical jingle. And it was like, and then like, he got me flowers. And then he got me this ring, and then he got me this necklace by this company. And it can be, uh, it can have your name on the back of it too. You know, should I, should I take him back, guys? And then they had, it was an advert. It wasn't actually a video. It was lying to me. It wasn't even someone's video. It actually said marketing by such and such. And the end of it said, buy our jewelry. Ah! This world... It's telling us everything upside down, back to front, that it should be. We were not meant to get meaning in the things of this world. We were meant to get meaning in, in him, in one person, alone. 
Let's look at that. What is the source of our Christian joy? Could you do me a favor? Audience participation now. I think you're ready for it. I've got you in the right place. Could you rise to your feet for me? We're going to have a mid-film intermission like the 1950s. Just don't go for popcorn. All right? Could you rise? Oh, trust me. Come on, trust me. It's no di- Just because I'm not like I've got a guitar or something. We're going to go into worship, and then we're going to go back into this preach. We're going to do right now what God made us to do. Are you ready? Or are you going to help me? Oh, you know, but I've got the best singing voice in the world. (laughs) (coughs) May we have lyrics on the screen, por favor? All right, okay. You'll have to, I don't know, you tell, you'll follow me. Do you really want to do that? (laughs) Okay, I'll start and he'll find me. You ready? One, (laughs) three. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room. And heaven and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing, and heaven and heaven and nature sing. Joy to the world, the Savior reigns. Let men receive and what fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains. Repeat the sounding joy, repeat the sounding joy. Repeat, repeat the sounding joy. No more you sin and sorrows grow. No thoughts infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow. For as the curse is Anyway, I'm not going to go there as a child. A different type of church. That was our point. That's what we were made to do. That was the purpose of mankind. In fact, that song, Isaac Watts, who wrote that song in the 1700s, he was having a fight with the church at the time. They said, no, you're not allowed to sing your own songs. You have to sing the Psalms word for word. He's like, how can I sing a song from Hebrew from thousands of years ago and make it sound nice in English today? And he went, right, then I'm going to write my own songs. And one of the songs that came out of that was Joy to the World. But it actually comes from this psalm here, Psalm 98. Okay? Can we go a little bit through it? And I'm going to show you how that psalm links with that song and what we're to do with our lives. Okay? It goes like this. Verse 1. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done wonderful things. Things. His right hand and his holy arm have gained the victory for him. The Lord has made known his salvation. He's revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his loving kindness and his faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Shout joyfully to the Lord. All the earth, break forth and sing for joy and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with the Lure, I think it's some sort of instrument. With the lure and the sound of melody, with trumpets and the sound of the horn, shout joyfully before the king, 
the Lord. Let the sea roar and all it contains. The world and those who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the mountains sing together for joy. Before the Lord, for he is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equities. Now, I don't have time to really exposit and unpack, and I guess that's the point of doing it this way. I don't have time to show you exactly where everything clicks. But verse 1 to 3, it's singing of this salvation that has come. The Lord has revealed his salvation to all the world. His wondrous works. He's shown his righteousness. He's shown his loving kindness. He's shown his faithfulness. What is that? And now I need to have a look at my, my, my particular uh, scripture references here. But in Colossians 2, 13 to 15, and Titus 3, 4 to 8, I'm not going to go there, but you see the cross of Christ. And you see that the cross, he's shown his loving kindness by sending Jesus Christ. He's shown his righteousness. He's shown his faithfulness through what he did at the cross. When he sent his son to die, that you may be set free from your sins and live forever in eternity and enjoy him forever. He is the reason this dark, dead, and dying world, they were like captives. They were like prisoners in the dark, and they saw a light but dimly. The angels suddenly appear to the shepherds by night, and do not fear, joy to the world. The Savior has come. This dark, dead, dying world, we had no way to sort out our, our miserable condition. No way to live forever. No way to deal with our sin. Yet, Jesus came. He came for you. He died on a cross that you may be set free from your sin and live forever. Jesus is the answer to the depression of this world. Jesus is joy to the world. Jesus is, should be, he should be the source of our joy. I find my meaning in Jesus. We just sang the song and it went, let every heart prepare him room. <laughs> your heart, is your heart open to receive Jesus tonight and let him become the source of your joy? But more than this, you're saying to yourself, okay, if verse 1 to 3 is talking about this Jesus who was coming, the Savior who, who came, past tense, what about the rest of this psalm? Because actually, when you look at the, look at the language, he has remembered his shout out, and, and it, it talks all about, for he has done this, he's done this, he's done that, he has made known, he has, it's all past tense. We today, the cross is past tense to us. The cross is in the past. The cross happened more than 2,000 years ago. But yet today, oh, Chris, I'm really struggling tonight. Chris, I'm, I'm, I'm depressed. Chris, I'm, I'm a Christian. Contradiction of terms, but I'm depressed. You know, Isaac Watts never wrote this as a Christmas song. He'd be quite confused if we were singing it at Christmas. You know what he wrote this song for? Let's go to verse 7 to 9. For he is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. When we're singing joy to the world, we're not just singing he came and he saved for me. We're actually singing, he's coming back. And when we open our mouths, when we shout joyfully, when we, when we, we, we the, use the guitar, we lure, and we, we sound the trumpet, we're joyful. Do you know what it actually means? It means there was dead silence. Absolute quiet. And suddenly, hallelujah! I get told off for my sound ranges. I'm so sorry. I just, someone's like, I can't, I can't hear again, I'm deafened on the sound desk, I'm so sorry. The sound, the word joyful, it figuratively means in the original language, like the sound 
of a trumpet like the sound over a quietness, the sudden sound of a trumpet, the sound of victory. And when you read your Bible, every time there's a victory, there's the sound of the, the shofar, the trumpet. When the Israelites would go to battle, they'd line up and then they would sing the, the holy warriors, the crazy fanatics. You wouldn't send your strongest troops to the front. you send your, Jesus! Hello. <laughs> but they would be at the front and they would sound the trumpet. They'd sound the trumpet. And the enemy would quiver. These guys are bold. These guys are confident. These guys think they're going to win this battle. And I'm not sure anymore. When we speak and we're singing, Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let every heart prepare him room. He comes to, to, to prove, the nations will prove. Uh, anyway, but what, what, what are we doing? We're speaking the truth of the not yet, the final victory, because it says there'll be a final trumpet call, then Jesus will come down. We're singing the truth of the not yet now. And on a spiritual level, those soldiers of the enemy who are causing misery, oh, that rhymes. There's quivering because we're singing truth that they know is true. They have been defeated. They have lost. And we have the final victory. More than that, you know, I was talking to someone once at work, not anymore, and he was like, oh, I've had a rubbish month. I've had a rubbish week. I've had a rubbish day. I'm going to go home tonight. I'm going to put my Christmas tree up, and I'm going to put some, some carols on, and I'm going to feel good. I'm like, you're not a Christian. Like, you're the very opposite of. <laughs> you know why? Because deep down, man was made to give God glory and enjoy him. And when you sing truth and you speak truth, you feel better. Why? Because you were made to feel good doing what you were made to do. Worship and glorify him. Get away from your notes. Stop it, Chris. There was, um, there was a prophet. His name was Kim Clement. And he used to sing a song. You can go on YouTube and search it. Kim Clement, go to the future. You know? And this is the song. I was listening to it before I came out. I want to get into the mood. They go like this. I want to go to the future and bring it back and bring it back. I want to go to the future and bring it back. And then suddenly they cut in. It says this. You're somewhere in the future and you look much better than you look right now. Somehow, in eternity, you are in that future place. You are in white robes. The peoples are proving your, the fact that you'll be on the other side of eternity You'll be the proof. What does it say? And make the nations prove the glories of his righteousness and wonders of his love. You'll be on the other side. You're going to look much better than you look right now. And you're going to be proof. Proof of his love. Proof of his goodness. Get away from your notes. Okay, I can't help myself. Uh, another Christian watchman, me. Chinese convert, Chinese uh, pastor, in the early days of um, when the communists had taken over, I'll be careful of politics and things, but there'd been a change in power in China, and he was in prison, and people would say of him, he was just, he used to really inspire me, fellow, fellow inmates, and when he died, he was in prison for 20 years, hard labor, like cracking rocks. When he died, they found under his pillow one little note, Bro, I'm really sick. My heart is filled with joy for Jesus. <laughs> you see, you might be chasing after, there's something that you're saying, I'll come to a close now, I'm going to just go right, right on. You might be saying to yourself, but I don't have my, my partner. 
I'm waiting on a husband. I'm waiting on my wife. I'm waiting on that car. I won't be happy until I have my own apartment. I won't be happy until I've got that promotion. I won't be happy until I have that, that thing, that visa, that passport, that nationality. I won't be happy until X, Y, and Z. That's the world that's conditioned our hearts to think that way. As a church, the reason why, this is my feeling, the reason why depression rates are almost the same, church, not church, atheist, whatever, is because yet we come here every week from birth, we've been so conditioned to look at the world in this way and get our joy from sources of joy in this world we need to put that to death tonight. Even right now, we pray. I'm not ending, but right now. Just, just close your eyes. What is it that you've been chasing? Because the things that we chase, sometimes they, we think it's the source of joy for our lives, but the fact that we don't have it becomes a source of misery. What is it that the Lord's showing you right now? Just ask him, what's, what's the thing I've been chasing? between you and him put it to death just say lord it's yours it might be a, a fair thing that's that's your right we should you know we all deserve to have children maybe you don't have a child we all deserve a partner we all there's certain things in life we deserve but the bible says seek first the kingdom of god and all else will be added to you and the bible also says and ron cannoli sings it love a bit of ron cannoli he says, what is the kingdom? What's the kingdom? Righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Ghost. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. That's the kingdom of God. And we could keep going. You seek after. It's like a worship service. Woo! You seek after the kingdom, and you will find joy. Because he will be your joy. The Bible says in his presence is the fullness of joy. The Bible says he loves to be glorified. The Bible says when we worship him, he inhabits the praises of Israel. And as we worship, build your throne. And as we worship him, in some spiritual sense, he is with us. He is present with us. We could be in a prison cell without windows. We could be experiencing the greatest holocausty type, horrible, sad, sad thing in the world. But no one can stop the Holy Spirit. No one can stop you from opening your mouth, doing what your body was meant to do, giving him glory. And entering into intimate presence and joy with our Lord. Even if, even if possibly Watchman Nee to cut his tongue out. Even if you can't worship him out loud. And even if you don't have a voice box. Sometimes I have songs in my head going around all day. Yesterday, I was like, what's going on? I looked at my girls. They were going, mm -hmm. and then I had to go, mm -hmm. and I go, mm -hmm. I was like, oh my gosh, a birthed offspring like me. <laughs> they have, they've got songs in their head like me all the time. Even if you don't have a voice box, you can bring him glory and enjoy his presence anywhere, any place. You can have joy. I'm going to end in a shortly. And and I really asked the Lord, like I said, Lord, I'm, I'm going to really try and avoid my notes. But if there's one thing, one thing that people are to take away, even if I go all over the place, because I'm trying to do something a bit different. I asked him, and I said, what's the one thing? And he said, Chris, you can never worship me enough. <laughs> and I saw a picture of the king and like a red Red carpet. This psalm and the technical, whatever, if you get into it, it's actually called an enthronement song. It's meant to be singing about like a king who's being enthroned. 
the ceremony of a king who's, who's taking his rightful position on the throne. And I saw him like walking past me on the red, the red carpet and people cheering. This now, and not yet will be when he sits. He, he has sat on the throne. He's put all the principalities and powers and rulers and authorities to shame. They are his footstool. He's had the final victory. But in this now place, it's, it's there, it's happened. We know he's sitting on the throne. We know that in eternity, the new age and new heavens, we will enjoy him forever. But in the now, it's almost like the enthronement is happening as the kingdom of God extends itself across this whole earth. And the king is walking on that red carpet to take his, it's very slow, one little step at a time towards his throne. You can join that party, that, that party in heaven that's coming. Never mind New Year's Eve party. The, the new earth and new heavens party is going to be amazing. But you can, you can ask the Lord and have a little bit of the not yet joy now. Jesus, and I'm going to end now, I'm going to pray. Jesus, we thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that you've saved us. We're being saved, and we will be saved. Thank you, Jesus, for what you've done when you died on a cross for me, for every person in the room. Thank you, Jesus, that you willingly went to the cross. You willingly died. And Lord, would you help us to, to become deprogrammed? Would you, would, you, would, you, would you help us, Lord, for the wiring of our hearts and the wiring of our minds and how this world has programmed us to, to seek joy and meaning in all of the wrong places? Lord, would you help us? Would you help to rewire us? Does it matter if I'm on the bus? Does it matter if I'm on a corridor at work? Does it matter if I'm shopping for a Christmas present? Does it matter if my boss is screaming at me? Doesn't matter if I'm on the shop floor and the customer's giving me issues. Doesn't matter if my visa request just got denied. Doesn't matter that my wife and I just had a shouting match. We didn't, by the way. Third party, whatever, rhetorical thing. Doesn't matter if someone in my family is just, it does matter, but someone's passed away. Lord, I can still seek you and I can still pull from that future. I can still go to that future because that future's real, it's present, we're there already somehow in some strange way. <laughs> Would you assure us, Lord? Give us assurance that when we think of the, the final day, we think of the judgment day, we're not like thinking like the films Armageddon and Terminator and this and that, where yes, it will be a, a horrendous day, but there's someone when they open their eyes again, new bodies it's going to be the greatest party that this cosmos has ever seen and you're going to be stuck with us we're going to, you're going to be in the center of it all and we're going to enjoy you forever and we're going to cast our crowns all the peoples all the nations all the tribes are going to say glory glory to the lamb <laughs> glory to you because you did this only you could do this. Would you help us to walk in joy? Mm. Stay in this place of just engaging with him and there's things that you need to put to death. Things that you you need to just, you know what, I've been chasing after that. And maybe, you know, I'm just going to give it to you, Lord. And I'm going to seek you first. I'm going to seek your joy. If there's things you need to put to death, just, just list it out to the Lord. Give it to him. The Lord said to me, I know it's the Lord when, when he uses weird language that I have to use a dictionary. Said tonight I'm disentangling from disentangling them from profanity, and I was like, profanity—that's swearing. And, and 
actually when I started to look at the, the meaning of profanity, the Latin meaning where that word comes from, it means non-sacred things. So Lord, I just pray right now, if there's something in your mind, there's an image of something, you're a memory of something that you know is like, that's not a sacred thing that I've been, I've been chasing after, hunting my meaning and joy in. Right now, Lord, I just pray, disentangle it right now in the name of Jesus. And Lord, I pray, Lord, that we would come right back to you and find you as the source of our joy in our lives, regardless of what gets thrown at us, regardless of what we're going through right now or will go through, no one, nothing can take my joy away because you saved me and you're coming back and I will be saved. Amen. I think I'm not, I'm not the leader tonight, the meeting leader. I think we should go back into song, shouldn't we? Yeah, let's rise to our feet and you're not ready for it, but hey ho, let's go for it. What have you got? What have you got up your, up your sleeve? <laughs> she'd, she'd always have a preach up your sleeve. She'd always have a song up your sleeve. Okay, I'll pass the mic to you, sir.